Well, hi there. The British biologist J.B.S. Haldane was once asked what his study of creation had taught him of the Creator. Haldane responded that he has an inordinate fondness for beetles. And thank goodness for this, beetles are rad! I did my master's research on Nicrophorus orbiculus burying beetles, which are easy to keep in captivity, but they are unbelievably smelly because the things that they bury are animal carcasses. What I have here today is a pet so reasonable to keep that it makes Chilean rosehair tarantulas seem like a real pain in the neck. These are blue death feigning beetles. These particular blue death feigning beetles come to us from our good friend Russ from Aquarimax Pets. If you aren't a subscriber to his channel, your life is not yet complete. What are you still doing here? Go, subscribe, you'll thank me later. Now that we're all subscribers to his channel, I think we can carry on with these incredible beetles. Blue death feigning beetles come from the same family of beetles as mealworms and superworms. If you didn't know that those were beetles, surprise! Beetles are part of a group of insects called the holometabola. These insects have a complete metamorphosis in that the juveniles, called larvae, and the adults are completely different one from the other, and they pupate in between. This is different from what you see in the hemimetabola, like praying mantises and cockroaches, where the juveniles, called nymphs, basically look like tiny wingless adults. The thing is that all insects are rad. And the reason that the creator appears to have an inordinate fondness for beetles is because there are over 350,000 described species. And every entomologist on the planet has a drawer full of undescribed beetles that they have been meaning to describe one of these days. The only problem with them is that they tend to be short-lived and not all of them are well suited to captivity. So is the blue death feigning beetle an exception? And is it the best pet insect for you? To help you figure this out, we are going to score the blue death feigning beetle based on our five categories, which are handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the blue death feigning beetle a score of five out of five. In fact, I think I'm gonna pick one up right now. There you go. Okay, so here's the deal. These are small and so you could smash them if you wanted to. Also, they produce a waxy coating for themselves to reduce water loss. And that could wear off if you handle them excessively, especially if you're like rubbing on them and petting them. If that should happen, if you should wear off that waxy covering, uh, you'll find that they're actually kind of shiny and black, but they will replace that waxing covering in a few days. Other than that, there are no downsides to handling these beetles. They aren't going to bite. Their tarsal claws are too tiny to scratch you, but they do help them hold on just a little bit. Since they aren't chordates, they don't have a tail with which to whip or to drop. They're just pleasant little guys putting up with a weird giant that occasionally carries them around. When it comes to care, we give the blue death feigning beetle a score of five out of five. What you need is a box, sand, food, and you're done. As long as you pick a box with slippery sides, you won't even need a lid. If you do use a lid, make sure it has excellent ventilation. These guys need to stay dry. There's no harm in giving them a large box. They can use the size, but the enclosure need not be anything big. Put in some play sand. They can't ingest it, so absolutely no risks from that. Just don't pour it on top of them. And then food. Food actually can be a real pain for some animals. Food was basically the only flaw of horned lizards, but it was pretty much a deal breaker. Well, it doesn't get too much better than this. These guys eat about anything that was once alive. They'll eat tiny amounts of washed and peeled fruits and vegetables and dried insects. These guys are desert scavengers. You notice I didn't say water. They actually get plenty of it from their food. I also didn't say lighting or heat. They don't need any. Literally, it's a box, sand, food, and not even a lot of food. If your enclosure is large enough that you can provide a warm basking spot for them and yet give them enough space to get far, far away from that heat, they will use a basking light. However, in the absence of such a light, they do great. I did mention that these guys can be kept in a small box, and that is true. However, I wouldn't recommend keeping a number 
this large of these beetles in this small of an area because they're gonna have a lot of interactions. There might be a day when a couple of them aren't getting along and they really can't get away from one another. So if you had a very reasonable aquarium, like a 10 gallon aquarium or a 20 gallon long aquarium, you can actually keep a large group of these beetles together, which means you're going to see all sorts of awesome social interactions occur between your blue death feigning beetles. And that's pretty neat. I'd like to take just a moment to say thank you to our rad fans and stinking rad fans at Patreon. And as it turns out, Russ has actually been a patron of ours for a very, very long time. And one of the cool things about Patreon is it actually gives us a lot more opportunities to interact with one another. And so we've been able to get to know Russ over the last few years. In fact, he even turned up in one of our videos a long, long time ago when we asked for patrons to talk about why they joined Patreon. And now today, Russ is here and we're filming a video together. And so, you know, that is just one of the many perks available to our patrons at Patreon as our way of saying thank you because you guys do so much to help us. When it comes to hardiness, we give the Blue Death Feigning Beetle a score of five out of five. Don't let them get too wet. Don't cook them or put them in the freezer. Don't smash them. Give them food. It's not rocket surgery. These beetles live a long time, many years, which is very different than most insects. Really, the only issue you might run into as far as lifespan is just if you get wild caught adults, you don't know how old they are when you get them. But if you got one that is a recently closed adult, it might live for many, many years for you, which is very different than what you're gonna see with most insect pets. When it comes to availability, we give the blue death feigning beetle a score of three out of five. This is really the only difficulty with these guys. Right now, they're almost all wild caught from the southwestern United States. And that's a good situation generally because they're probably going to arrive in good condition and they're probably well managed in the wild. But it does mean that they are only available seasonally. So they're gonna be seasonally available online, maybe at some expos, and very rarely in pet shops. Work is being done to figure out how to get them to pupate and eclose in captivity. That's really been the main challenge with these guys. And Russ, he's gonna to talk to us in a little bit about that very topic. But for now, this is really the only problem with these as pets, is availability. Because when it comes to upfront costs, we give these guys a score of five out of five. The beetles themselves, they're only a few dollars. Shipping isn't even that expensive for most arthropods since they don't necessarily need to be there overnight. Then you're gonna need a box of sand, uh, glass or slippery plastic preferred, and having some dried insects on hand would be a good idea. They sell those in bags that will last your beetles a very long time for just a few bucks. Then you're done. It's a bit more than putting a black widow or a jumping spider in a jar, but not a lot more. And this is why in conclusion, we give the blue death feigning beetle a score of 4.6 out of five. If you have a box of sand and some food, you probably want a death feigning beetle. In addition to the sand, if you really want to go over the top, you could put a little bit of wood and other cage furnishings on which they can climb. Make sure it won't allow them to climb out of your enclosure, especially if you don't have a lid, but they will use that and it'll actually make it a lot more fun to observe them as well. Now here is the legendary Russ from Aquarimax Pets to give us a little update on the keeping and breeding of these amazing beetles. I found out about these basically from a website called Bugs in Cyberspace and saw how that they were extremely hardy. They're extremely long lived and very active. Uh, you can, they're always up to something, especially if you're keeping them in a group and you can also keep them with other creatures like velvet ants, for example. And so that's kind of what attracted me to them. But then I realized that for all the years that people have been keeping them, they weren't really being bred. So I started doing a little bit of research on that. And I found that there was a researcher who had actually sequenced the genome of this species of beetle who had cracked the code on breeding them. But again, very few people were doing it. So I contacted him, his name is Dean Ryder. And he said that they need a temperature as, uh, as larvae, mature larvae, they need a temperature of about 88 degrees Fahrenheit to induce them to pupate successfully. So I decided to try that and I, uh, I took some larvae, basically getting the larvae is, is extremely easy as long as you have a large enough enclosure with 
a temperature gradient and a humidity gradient. Basically, you want some substrate that's a little bit um, deeper and more moist on the uh, lower layers of that substrate on the cooler side of the enclosure, and you want some organic material in there. So things like leaf litter, um, some pieces of uh, decomposing oak wood, that kind of thing. They're not, comp they're not extremely particular about exactly what kinds of organic material they need, but something like that on that side. And then you have a warm side under the light. And again, you'll need a large enough enclosure to make this thermal gradient possible and humidity gradient or moisture gradient possible. And if you do that, the eggs which they will produce, I mean, there's no problem getting the beetles to mate or to lay eggs, but the eggs either will not hatch or they won't last very long as larvae if they don't get enough moisture in the substrate and there's not something for them to eat. And so as long as you do that, you can get larvae and the larvae will mature right in the enclosure with the adults. But once they reach approximately 1.75 to 2 inches, they will die in those same conditions. So you need to take them out, put them in an incubator at about 88 degrees Fahrenheit, about 75 to 80 percent relative humidity, and put them in a deli cup with some ventilation but no way for the beetles to escape. And then if everything goes well, they will pupate. And I had uh, this happen in June, the first successful pupation and um, e-closing event occurred and this specimen right here is the result. It has been 12 days since this blue death veining beetle emerged from the pupa. It's the first captive bred death veining beetle that I've produced and one of the few to be produced in captivity. You can see that it is now finally starting to show a little bit of bluish coloration mostly on the legs, on the head, a little bit on the thorax. So it might be a while, but it appears to be coloring up normally. And so um, captive breeding is very possible, especially if you already have an incubator. Many of you are reptile keepers anyway. If you have a hovabator or another um, reptile incubator around, the conditions are going to be fairly simple to uh, replicate the conditions you need. So you might as well try it and we'll get more of these captive bred beetles. Um, in the hobby, which would be great. Um, you do need to make sure you have males and females, and the easiest way to do that is to look very closely at the antennae with the magnifying lens. Now, females are often larger, but that's not always true. Uh, so the only sure way to tell is to look at the antennae close up, and the underside of the antennae uh, will be much hairier in a male than in a female. Thank you so much, Russ. And if you haven't subscribed yet to his channel, get over there right now, go subscribe. And we just made a video, he and I together, about Madagascar hissing cockroaches to help you figure out if that is the best pet insect for you. So you gotta go over there and check it out. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Well, let's kill this and do the next one. Can't we just move them? What are they talking about? No, we have to kill them. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Russ, I should have said something. Yeah, if I had known. Jason, he's what like this. About? Okay, now that we're all subs- Oh, sorry, I need to simmer that down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Gee whiz. Yeah, Jason would prefer for you to slap me in the back of the head first and then tell me. Immediately, though. Yeah. Well, hi there. Hi. There's- Oh, you missed it. That would have been funny to what was There's it? There's three, there were three stacked on top of that big one, and it was walking around, and it was like three stories of beetles. It was like Yertle the Turtle <laughs> Beetle Edition. <laughs> Aww. Quite possibly the best book ever written on the subject of turtle stacking. <laughs> All right. Wait for the said truck. Yeah. <laughs> what are they overcompensating for, Flint? Probably the fact that they're very soft-spoken in their everyday lives. <laughs>